Thank you, Matthew, Elaine, and Dale. <clears throat> Excuse me. My voice started going after the uh, first service, and <clears throat> I hope it comes back. But anyway, bear with me, please. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. If you would turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, please. First Samuel chapter 17. When you get there, if you would place a bulletin or a piece of paper marker or something in there and sit it to the side for just a few moments and we'll get to it. This will help throat savor. Really? Okay. What will it do to me? You'll be able to sing. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> wow, I feel much <clears throat> better. <laughs> Where do you buy that stuff? That's uh... <clears throat> Wow. Thank you, Matthew. Eleven days ago, a woman by the name of Ina Koenig 37-year-old kindergarten teacher. Had taken 40 of her students, 40 students, along with chaperones, out on a field trip out to the woods. Time to observe nature. Let's look at the trees. Let's identify. Some of the trees, some of the vegetation, bugs, animals, Let's, it was a fun day. It was a great day for exploring, beautiful day. Kids were laughing and playing, exploring, having a good time. When all of a sudden there was a scream. One of the boys by the name of Janik was walking there in the woods, and off to the side a little ways, there were wooden planks laying on the ground. A little bit of vegetation had kind of grown over it over the years. And he was walking on those planks when all of a sudden they gave way. And he fell down a mine shaft. 75 feet deep. Ina ran over immediately. She, she had no idea how deep the hole was. She had no idea whether she would be able to rescue the boy or not. It was, it was dark. She couldn't see anything down there. But she jumped in anyway. She was going to do what she could do to try to save this child and so she fell the 75 feet down the shaft. It was an old mine. It had been closed up 100 years before. When Ina hit the, the bottom, she hit water. Water had accumulated over the years, and fortunately, the water was there because it broke the fall, hers and the boys. And water was deep. It was freezing cold. You couldn't see anything. Oh, light up above, but she tried to feel around as best she could and located the boy. And she grabbed a hold of whatever she could on the side of the, the mining shaft, maybe a, a little bit of root here or stone or something. And for two hours until rescue came, she struggled to keep the head of the child above water. Both were saved. Hero. 
The dictionary defines a hero as someone who's noted for feats of courage, nobility of purpose, especially when they risk, risk their life. Bottom line, there are people who have stepped beyond the norm to help others, hero. I don't know about you, but when I was a child, I had all kinds of heroes. Roy Rogers, Lone Ranger, Hoplong Cassidy, Sky King, Superman, Gene Autry, Cisco Kid. Do you recognize any of these? Sergeant Preston of the Yukon, great, Dale and I were the two. Okay, but there's a whole list of people. They were my heroes. But the funny thing is, they were all fictional. They were all make-believe. We need real heroes. Let's turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and read what the Word of God says. Starting with verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoka, which belonged to Judah and pitched between Shoka and Asika and Epheshtamim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. Philistines over here, Israel over here. Well, we know a number of things about the Philistines. They were a seafaring people. They were very comfortable around the water. Our spiritual ancestors were not. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they were Bedouins. They didn't like the water that much. The Philistines came from Crete. And when they arrived in Canaan, they settled along the shoreline. Well, that made sense. Again, they're very comfortable with the water, and so that's where they settled. It's kind of interesting from Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. The Word of God tells us that when God directed, when He led the children of Israel out of Egypt to the Promised Land, He didn't take the short route. He took the long route. He took the people away from the Philistines. He didn't want them to see them. He didn't want them to see that they had weapons. They had lots of weapons, more advanced than what the children of Israel had. They had lots of And if the children of Israel saw the Philistines, they would have run back to Egypt. From the time the children of Israel settled in the Promised Land to the time of Saul, there had been a number of skirmishes back and forth between these nations. But now it had come to a head. So there they were. Again, according to verse 2 and 3, Philistines in the Valley of Elah on a mountainside over here, and the Israelites in the Valley of Elah and the mountain over here. They look at each other with the valley in between. We read in verse 4, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. About nine feet nine inches tall. A champion. If you have the King James Version or the NIV or the NASB, that's the word that's used there. The Philistine champion came. By the way, Goliath was just a little over three feet taller than LeBron James. He was huge. The Hebrew word that is used there for champion is ish. It just simply means man. 
Sure, he was, he was a tall man, but he was, he was just a man. That's all he was. Same thing is true in verse 23. If you have the King James, NIV, NASB, the word champion is there. But it changes in verse 51. If you have the King James Version or the NASB, it's still champion, but if you have the NIV, it's the word hero. It's a different Hebrew word, gabor. The word gabor appears 159 times in the Old Testament. It refers to giants or military men or, or those who really have excelled. It's a word that's used even of God. Heroes. <laughs> you know this story. So here we have a young teenager by the name of David, a shepherd boy whose equipment nothing but a slingshot. And he went out to face a huge, powerful, heavily equipped hero of the Philistines. And David won. He killed the giant. The hero is dead. Turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 6 and 7. And it came to pass as they came, and when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul. They came out to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, with instruments of music. But notice... And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Well, who's the hero now? Goliath? Well, I don't think so. He was defeated by a young, a young shepherd boy and he's dead. Saul? No, not really. David's the hero. I am not advocating hero worship. I'm, I'm not. But imagine how David felt that day. And even for the days and the months and the years that followed, because David did other things too, and he became a hero in the eyes of the people. Everywhere he went. There's David... Hey, hey, did you see him? There, there's David over there. People were so excited. They wanted his autograph. They, they wanted to rub shoulders with him. Can I have a selfie with David? <laughs> well, you get the idea. People were excited too. Because they had a hero. And he wasn't make-believe. You know, it's interesting, in 2 Samuel chapter 23, you find a list of Gabor men. You find a list of hero men who join themselves to David. You see, heroes have a tendency to attract heroes. In fact, heroes have a tendency to produce heroes. And so the heroes came and they joined with David. It's an exciting story. I love this. I, I love a good story. I, that was 3,000 years ago. And we're still talking about David today. I thought it was interesting even when I went to Israel, and I've gone a number of times. Sure, we talk about David in Sunday school classes and once in a while worship service, whatever, but I thought it was interesting over in Israel that people still talk readily about David. 
I like a good story. But there's also a tragedy that was going on at the same time. Over all these years when David was doing so many things, we don't have a list of them, but doing so many things and gaining and gaining and gaining more and more that hero status. Let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 18. 2 Samuel chapter 18. Looking at verse 33. And the king, well, it's David now, no longer Saul. And the king was much moved, went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, I would, God, I had died for thee, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son, my son, my, my son. I'm skipping a lot of stuff, I know that, I'm sorry, but time, I have to. And Absalom is son of David. David had 19 sons from his wives, plus some from his concubines. Oh, that's for another day. We'll deal with that. But Absalom was child number three, son number three. To make a long story short, while David, throughout the years, is building this reputation of being a hero, there's all kinds of drama going on in his home. Absalom is dead. He's dead. According to verse 33, David has gone up to the second story room above the gate. Information given in Scripture, detail, is always for purpose. David's up there in that room and he's just crying his heart out uncontrollably. Absalom! 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 It's a horror. It's an absolute horror to outlive one of your children. But David also has guilt. Because he knows now that there's so much that he could have done. I have no way to prove it. But I suspect that outside, down below at the gate, I suspect that the people are singing again about David. Well, why wouldn't they be? Another battle has been won. David's side won. Again, to thousands of people, to thousands of people, he's a hero. But not to his family. I uh, pulled a book out of my library here a couple weeks ago. I want to look through it again. The book was written by Mary Lee Dunker. It's called Days of Glory, Seasons of Night. She's gotten the book out again. It's under a different title, I think, a different publisher called uh, Man of Valor. It's the story of her father, Bob Pierce. I suspect that there are some here today, there have to be some, who are familiar with the name Bob Pierce. Bob Pierce was the founder of World Vision. He was also the founder of Samaritan's Purse, which is headed by Franklin Graham today. 
Mary Lee, writing about her dad, she makes comment about his work, his ministry in the Orient, and this is what she says, and I quote. She says, my father was not just a celebrity there, he was a hero. But then she goes on in the book and she talks about her family. Dad, yes, but family. She talks about her older sister, Sharon. Sharon, Sharon needed the approval of dad. She always, she needed dad. She was always crying out for her father, but he was gone. And when she would talk to him on, on the phone, she said, Dad, I need you to come home. I, I need you here. I, I need you. I need you here. Sharon finally committed suicide. She was so desperate, so lonely. Shortly after that, Bob Pierce went to the court and got a legal separation from his wife and family. They needed him. He did so much, but he failed at home. Hero. Like Pastor Joel, I always enjoyed those dedication Sundays. Always a time of enjoyment. And it was a time to acknowledge ownership and responsibility. As many of you here this morning know, Carolyn and I have eight children. From the time they were born, we acknowledged who they belonged to. They belonged to the Lord. But we have responsibility. We had a responsibility to feed them, to clothe them, to wash them. We had a responsibility in the middle of the night when they would wake up sick and throw up all over. We had the responsibility to take care of them and clean it up. We had the responsibility to be there for them. That was so important to me. You see, I didn't feel like my parents were always there for me. But I wanted to be there with my children and for my children. But it's important that you understand that at the top of the list, we had a responsibility to pray for our children. I still do. Had a responsibility to point them clearly to the Lord Jesus Christ. To explain to them what salvation is, who Jesus Christ is, why he came, what he did, and how you need to accept Jesus Christ as Savior in order to be saved, in order to even go to heaven. Had a responsibility to teach them the principles and the standards of the Word of God. And we had a responsibility to model it before them. A responsibility to try to be their spiritual heroes. I always enjoyed playing sports, but I knew I was not going to be a sport hero to my kids. Love music, but <laughs> trust me, I was not going to be a musical hero to my kids. I wasn't going to be a financial hero. I, I just wanted to try to be a godly hero. I have no idea how many dedications I've been a part of over the years. I, I don't... I have no idea. Lots. 
And like Pastor Joel, I would do the same. I would always challenge and encourage the parents. But as Pastor Joel said, we all have a responsibility. And during the last years of my ministry before retiring, whenever I would take part, whenever I would have a dedication, I would always have the congregation to stand too. I talked to the, the parents, and when I was done, then I talked to the congregation. I'd have them stand, and I would speak to them about their responsibility, your responsibility. And I would ask them to respond. You see, our children need to grow up in an environment where they are surrounded by godly people. Not just good people, not just simply moral people, but they need to grow up in an environment of godly heroes. Heroes. Retired Brigadier, Brigadier General Joe Foss, who has won Congressional Medal of Honor, he said, and I quote, America needs a new generation of heroes. People who are ruled by a conscience that doesn't take the Ten Commandments lightly. People who have a fundamental reverence for their creator and respect for the people and things he has created. And I agree with that. But I will be more specific. Our nation has a great need for godly heroes. Moms and dads, women, men, young people who are committed to living out the principles of the Word of God, modeling the Word of God consistently for their own benefit, for the glory of God, but for the benefit also of others. Heroes. Hey guys, how are you doing? How are you doing? According to an article that appeared in USA Today back quite some time ago, they said that 40% of young people between the ages of 9 and 13 have no hero. They don't have anyone that they look up to. Between the ages of 9 and 13, you realize that falls within the, the period of time when children, most of them make a commitment to Jesus Christ. Sixty percent of those who do have a hero, 52.9 percent of them say that their hero is a relative or a friend. 31.5 percent say that their hero is an athlete. 11.3 percent say their hero is a fictional character or a religious person. And 8.7% say their hero is a politician or historical figure. Heroes. I have three real quick questions for you this morning. Question number one, how many heroes did you have when you were growing up? Question number two, how many heroes do you have today? And question number three, which I think is more important than the other two, whose hero are you? I'm convinced that David knew that he was a hero to the people. There's no question in my mind about that. He knew it. But I wonder if he ever stopped and asked himself the question, Am I a hero to my family? Did he care? Two weeks ago, our oldest granddaughter graduated from high school. 
I don't know why, but I, it may be in connection, I'm, I'm sure, with this message. I started thinking about her fifth birthday. We were invited to the house to celebrate the birthday, and again, we've got a fairly large family, so you take our children and their children. And I, I don't know how many people were there at the house. There were a lot of people, including my mother-in-law and father-in-law who were living at that time. Well, outside, they were grilling food. There, there was just all kinds of food out there. Picnic tables, other tables, and, and people were, it was all filled up. My mother-in-law and father-in-law decided they'd sit inside the house. There was a, a window there next to the, the table, and they could see everyone. They decided that they would sit inside the house. Being a wonderful son-in-law, I decided I'd go in and I'd sit with them. So as we were sitting there, really kind of out of the blue, I made a comment to my father-in-law. I always referred to my father-in-law as, as Whitey, Lawrence White. I played ball with him before Carolyn and I were married. We played church ball together. And so it was always Whitey. And I was sitting there at the table. I looked across the table at him, and I said, Whitey, I want you to know something. You're one of my heroes. And his eyes just filled with water, and he looked down. And he made the statement, I'm nobody's hero. That wasn't true, but I've never forgotten that statement. Professor George Moore, English uh, he said, and I quote, he said, nothing is more depressing than the conviction that one is not a hero. Let me paraphrase that. Nothing is more depressing than the conviction that no one looks up to you. Hero. Professor Scott Allison from the University of California teaches a course on the heroes of society. And what Professor Allison does is on the first day when the students come into the room, he has them sit down and he says, take out a, a piece of paper and a pencil, pen, whatever, and I want you to draw a hero. And he says, almost without exception. They draw a picture of a superhero with a cape and a mask and hero accessories. I hope you understand that a hero doesn't have to kill giants. That a hero doesn't have to wear a cape or a mask. You see, that's not what Absalom was looking for. He was simply looking for a dad he could look up to. He was looking for a dad he could pattern his life after. Hero. Next week is Father's Day. I did a little checking before this week. And I found that on the average day in the United States, there are 2.3 million people locked up in federal, state, or local jails. 2.3 million people are locked up. 
Now listen very carefully. 93.3% of those people are males. They're males. Dr. James Dobson, in his book, Bringing Up Boys, says that years ago, an executive from a greeting card company came up with the idea, I want to go to a prison, get permission, of course, I want to go to a prison and I want to take cards along and on Mother's Day or for Mother's Day, I want to announce to all of the inmates that you can come and you can write in a card, Mother's Day card, and we'll send it for you. No, no cost, no charge for anything. Cards are free, we'll send them for free. You don't have to do anything, just come. Well, the day came and the line was formed and there was a huge line. The executive said to some, those he brought with him, he said, you better get back to the factory, get more cards and get back here quick. Because they wouldn't have enough cards with what they originally brought. The men wanted to send out cards. You see, no matter what they had done, in spite of what they had done in their life, they still loved and honored mom. They went to send a card. The executive thought, hey, this was a great idea I had. A great idea how to give spawn to a second great idea. We'll turn around, we'll do the same thing on Father's Day. Contacted the prison, they said okay. They were thrilled with what had happened. The executive uh, took many more cards this time. He was ready for them, and announced to all the inmates, you can come, fill out a card, and we'll send it free for dads for Father's Day. Not a single inmate came. They didn't look up to their dad. In so many cases, they didn't know who dad was. Author Barbara Jackson says, and I quote, it's far easier to build strong children than repair broken men. Think that one through. It is far easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. It is far easier to build strong children than repair broken men or women. Don't miss the point. David was a hero to thousands of people. He was willing to stand up against a giant when nobody else would. Here's the whole Israeli army, and they're looking across the valley, and here are the Philistines, and the Philistines have said, come on, just face one of us. Just come and face our champion. And a little shepherd boy did. A shepherd who had become a king. A king who would build a powerful nation. A king who did all kinds of things to gain that reputation of being a hero. Hero to thousands, but not to his son. What a tragedy. Sure, we need to point the young generation we need to point them to the Word of God, to the Noahs and the Moseses and the Joshuas and the Jeremiahs and the Marys and the Peters and the Pauls and the... 
We need to show them videos. Put heroes before them. We need to show them videos of the David Brainers or the Jim Elliots or the Amy Carmichaels or the William Careys, the Adoniram Judsons and the Hudson Taylors and the Billy Grahams and the on and on. Yes, do that. But we need to start by showing them heroes in the context of the home and the church. Ina. She was a hero that day. I, I don't know anything else about her. But that day she jumped into a, a hole. She didn't know how deep, she didn't know she could, she didn't know she would live, she didn't know she'd die. She, At least one day, she was a hero. But I tell you, my friends, that we have a younger generation that needs heroes every day. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of the mighty man, as arrows are in the hand of the Gabor man, as arrows are in the hand of the hero man, so are the children of the youth. Oh, Father, may we seek to be godly heroes. You want so much for us and of us and Know how important it is everywhere we go, but especially in the context of the home. Thank you for the Inas, those who will step in when there's an emergency and do and risk. And thank you for the heroes. But thank you, Father, for those who don't slay giants. Thank you for those heroes who don't wear a cape or a mask. Just men and women, young people, who seek to be the godly people you've called them to be. For their sake, for your glory, but again, for others. Father, in just a moment, I'm going to come down here in front and just wait for a moment or two. We have deacons, deaconesses here in front. Father, we're going to wait for just a couple moments. I, less than, than they. I pray, Father, that if you're speaking to someone's heart today, Someone who needs to come to Christ. That's where it all starts. They need to come to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. It takes courage. Father, it does. It takes courage to step out from others and come forward. May they have the courage to do so. Maybe there are those who have come to recommit themselves. They need to do that, may they come. Maybe there are those who have come to present themselves for membership. Father, David looked back and it was too late to do what he needed to do. And again, what a horror. 
May we be forward lookers. Know and see what we need to do now, even for the future. If we need to step forward today for Christ, may we come. We'll give you the thanks and the praise in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Is the Lord speaking to you today? Do you need to come? Do you need to come to receive Christ as your Savior? Do you need to come to recommit your life? Would you come to present yourself for membership? If the Lord's speaking to you, may you have the courage to come. Father, how we thank you for who you are. How we thank you for the high calling you have given. Not just that we come to Christ, but that we follow. That we reproduce in our life the kind of life that the Lord Jesus had lived. Oh, Father, do encourage us how we need that in these days give us the resolve to be the people you want us to be not just simply to sit back and settle in and conform with most around us but may we really seek to be godly people those that others can look up to our children other children May they be able to say, I have a hero. It's you. Father, thank you for all you give, all you are, all you provide. Give us strength, wisdom, and encouragement to your glory in Christ's name. Amen. Maranatha, God bless you. Have a great week.